Somewhere, not far from Earth, a star enters its death throes and explodes in a violent supernova. Leaving in its wake the strangest phenomenon in the cosmos, a black hole. Our galaxy may be infested with millions of them. But now there's evidence of something even more ominous. Black holes of unfathomable size and power. That's a big galaxy and right down at the center you can't see it. A black hole that's got a mass you know, that approaches a billion suns. Astronomers are now studying them in unprecedented detail and finding they are bigger, stronger, and more destructive than anyone imagined. We'd like to think black holes are far, far away, but what if there's one on our cosmic doorstep? A team from Europe and another from the United States are in a high-tech race to be the first to see into the very heart of the galaxy. Now, an extraordinary new experiment is giving astronomers a first ever glimpse inside a black hole to see what's in the lair of the monster of the Milky Way. A new era in astronomy has begun. High-tech instruments in space are now revealing a universe rocked by violent events. JPL Com, Chandrosi. In the distant galaxies, astronomers have witnessed space and time shattered by eruptions so vast they boggle the mind. To put this on sort of an Earth scale, it's equivalent to about a trillion, trillion, trillion atomic explosions. But what could produce such awesome power? Whatever it is, it lives at the center of our own Milky Way. Scientists now believe it is the largest and most powerful object in the universe, and yet it emits no light. It is called a black hole. First suggested by Albert Einstein's equations, a black hole is space and time twisted into a furious knot. But the great scientists believed it could never exist in nature. Albert never really liked the idea of black holes himself. He thought they were anathema. This was something that nature should avoid. It's the places where space and time became infinitely twisted up. He thought, no, nature shouldn't allow that. Black holes are certainly odd beasts in the universe. They were thought to be peculiar, so peculiar as to perhaps not even really exist in the real world. Simply because your equations show that they can exist doesn't require that the real universe has them. That there is something strange and powerful lurking in the center of our galaxy first became clear 75 years ago. Early radio telescopes recorded a hiss like the sound of steam. As a young astronomer, Eric Becklin was determined to get to the bottom of this mysterious energy source. First, he had to find it. There was a radio source called Sagittarius A, a very strong radio source, but there was even debate whether that was really the center or not. Astronomers knew that the centers of other galaxies are tightly packed with stars, but when they tried to see into the center of our galaxy, those stars were obscured behind a thick veil of dust. There is so much dust between us and the galactic center, it is completely opaque. You do not see the stars in the galactic center. The most powerful telescopes cannot see it. Becklin knew that some kinds of light, invisible to our eyes, can make it through the dust. Infrared, for example, travels in slightly longer wavelengths. Infrared radiation gets through the dust because its wavelengths are longer and the dust just kind of rides on the infrared wave. 
In the 1960s, Becklin bought an infrared detector from a military contractor and attached it to the end of a telescope. It was in August of 1966. It was a beautiful night. As we were looking uh, with the infrared detector, uh, we were seeing more and more stars. And the signal increased. And each star gives you more signal. And we were building up, as we were getting closer to the center, more and more stars. We were actually seeing through the dust for the first time, and then came to a peak, and then back down again. And I knew immediately that that was the center of our Milky Way, and that I was the first person to actually see the stars in the very core of our galaxy. Eric Becklin had discovered the very heart of the Milky Way, the exact location of the mysterious energy source. But its staggering power meant that this was no ordinary star. Scientists believed the only one thing that could explain the mystery was the very idea that Einstein had rejected, an object that defies explanation. What's a black hole? It's this monstrous, mysterious thing. It's a point of infinite density. We don't know how to wrap our brains around that. It's a region where space and time have closed in on itself. A black hole is a region of space where the pull is, of gravity is so immense that not even light can escape it. You reach the point where light cannot even come out. And if light can't come out, you're not coming out. And if light plus you are not coming out, it's a black hole. There's no other phrase we can possibly use to describe it. Welcome to the strange world of extreme physics, where space and time literally cascade into the abyss. Space itself is falling inside the black hole. It's rather like a, a river falling over a waterfall, except it's space itself that's falling over the cliff. It's rather like a kayaker trying to make their way upstream on a river that's going too fast. They get dragged down to the center of the black hole. Gravity becomes a riptide. The closer you get, the stronger the current. Eventually, you reach the event horizon, the point of no return. Matter goes inside the surface of the black hole, shrinks down to the very center where it gets destroyed in a region of infinite warp space and time, and it's gone. The gravity at your feet, if they're closer to the black hole, is a little bit stronger than the gravity at your head, and you feel that as something that is tearing you apart. The tidal forces unrelentingly getting stronger as they exceed the molecular forces that bind your flesh. And so you end up moving through space-time like toothpaste through a tube. And ultimately, it will pull your atoms apart. You will be, as we say. As strange as they are, black holes are a product of the familiar universe of stars and gravity. They have their genesis in a type of enormous star called a red supergiant. It is 10 times heavier than our sun, yet it will burn itself out in a fraction of the sun's lifetime. Deep inside, the crush of gravity sends temperatures roaring above a billion degrees. Helium and carbon fuse into heavier elements, oxygen, silicon, sulfur. Then, the star implodes under its own immense gravity, sending a shockwave roaring out. The star digs itself deeper into space travel and now goes supernova in a violent explosion. What's left is a dense core of subatomic particles, a neutron star, only about 16 kilometers across. It's so dense that a teaspoonful of neutron star matter would weigh about a billion tons. Eventually, the gravitational pressure will be so large that the neutrons themselves will be crushed and there'll be nothing left to stop the collapse. A 
a black hole is born. It's a million times the mass of the Earth, but compressed so tightly, it literally exits the known universe. Now, the effect of that mass is still in our universe. The mass is still here in that it's causing this fold in space that goes all the way down. It's become a hole. The best way to look at it is, if you stick your finger down in there, you ain't getting it back. We know exactly what effect a black hole is gonna have on its environment, on the stars in its vicinity, on the gas that wanders a little too close. So, will we ever see a black hole? No. But that's not what's important here. What's important here is, we can see its paw print. In search of a black hole's paw print, Eric Becklin is on a lifelong quest to probe the center of our galaxy. The Milky Way is a giant spiraling disk of over a hundred billion stars. Our sun is about halfway out in the peaceful suburbs. Becklin is headed to the galaxy's most exciting and most violent zones. But to make the final leg of the journey, he would need help. So he turned to a rising star in astronomy. Andrea Goetz believes that the key to finding a black hole at the center of our galaxy lies in tracking the stars that buzz around it. For about three decades or so, there has been this question of whether or not our galaxy harbors a supermassive black hole at its center. And the key to answering this most definitively is to watch stars at the center of the galaxy orbiting. Gets his team set up at the newly built Keck telescope on the summit of Hawaii's Mauna Kea volcano, the largest telescope ever built. Our view to the center of the galaxy is absolutely superb. Our ability to position stars at the center of the galaxy is like somebody in Los Angeles seeing somebody in New York be able to move their finger like this, okay, just two centimeters. That's the precision with which we can measure something that is 26,000 light years away from us. Madeline, we're ready to go. The conclusive experiment to be done that really demonstrated that it was a black hole was to follow the orbits of individual stars very, very accurately and with the highest precision possible. But the stars in the center of the galaxy were not the only thing Getz and Becklin had to keep track of. Another group working in the mountains of Chile was hot on the same trail, led by Reinhard Gensel from Germany. This guy here. It's a little too dense to be just a random collection. We suspect that in the galactic center, they are maybe hiding uh, very massive black holes. To really be sure that there are black holes, we have to go in there as close as we can. So we can make measurements really good enough now that we can say it must be a black hole. Both teams wanted to be the first to prove that our galaxy harbors a supermassive black hole, but Gensel and his team had a three-year head start. The amazing precision of Keck is the ace in the hole for Gens and her team. Mark Morris is a veteran of the Galactic Center search. The German group had already started to make headway on the Galactic Center even while we were deciding to pursue this. So we knew that in, if, in a head-to-head -head competition, that it, as long as they were using the small 2.2 meter telescope that they were using compared to our 10 meter telescope, that uh, we would blow them away. <laughs> right speck on the top of this inset. That's the star which really has given us the essential clue for the black hole. It was certainly high excitement, but on the other hand, we would have to compile like at least five years of data before we could see the stars move. But what kind of cosmic monster was pulling the stars along? This is our road map. And that's the center of our galaxy. There's a large cluster of stars that are orbiting the center of our galaxy. Basically, the way this experiment works is you take an image, you see where all the stars are, and then uh, you come back sometime later and you take another image and you look to see if they've moved. 
So the second time we took an image, we knew we the time we took an image, we knew we were um, uh, golden. That those stars had clearly moved. The first order of business was to see how large the object is, to weigh it by measuring its gravity. So we have the black hole here, and then the more massive it is, the more pull there is. The more pull there is, as it gets close to the black hole, the faster it goes. And we are measuring the speed of these stars. That's the key to getting the masses, measuring the speed of those stars. Andrea's more advanced telescope made the difference. The object weighed in at a staggering three million times that of our sun. But that didn't prove it's a black hole. It could still be a cluster of smaller objects. For the Germans, it was time to even the playing field. The VLT, Very Large Telescope, opened its doors on a mountain in Chile. Both the VLT and Keck were upgraded with revolutionary technology. For years, the teams relied on computers to pinpoint the location of stars through the turbulence of our atmosphere. Now, they could cancel it out with a new system known as adaptive optics. It uses a powerful laser beam to read the turbulence. Telescope operators can use those readings to sharpen the image of distant stars and galaxies. So this little animation shows you the benefit of adaptive optics. So you see the stars without adaptive optics, you turn the adaptive optics on, and all of a sudden you see stars. And in particular, you see stars near the center of the galaxies. We track all of them, but these are the ones that are the key to the problem. These new eyes were delivered just in time. With both teams watching, one of the stars made a dramatic hairpin turn around the center. In 2002, it made a huge jump to over here. So it went whoop, all the way around. The okay. star was initially going very slowly and then moving around very quickly, and at that point coming very, very close to the central black hole. And it's moving on order 10 million miles per hour, so it's just speeding away. The star had come close enough for the teams to see that it had to be circling a single massive object. All other physical explanations of uh, what was at the very center uh, were gone. The only thing left was a black hole. To astronomers around the world, the evidence was impressive. I have to say, when I first saw Andrea's video, I was stunned when I saw that star come out of the left side of the frame and go zipping around and go shooting off into the other end of the frame and it moved around a point in space, and nothing was there. That we could, with our uh, instruments, together with our minds, effectively travel to the center of the galaxy, 26,000 light years away, and collect the evidence for such an incredible object was really an amazing achievement. The European and American teams had confirmed that a black hole was there without actually seeing it. From our quiet corner at the far edge of our galaxy's spiral, it's hard to imagine the violence at its center. The closer you draw toward the center, the denser it gets. Our destination, the galaxy's central hub, brimming with stars, known simply as the Bulge. Venture into the Bulge, and you enter a busy highway. It's jammed with star traffic, speeding in every direction, and it's always rush hour. There's a lot of gas. There's a lot of dust. This is absolutely the most crowded place in our galaxy. There will be stars all around us, an incredible density of stars. I mean, we couldn't exist there. There's lots of ultraviolet radiation, X-rays are floating around, gas clouds bash into each other, a lot of activity. It's a very hostile environment, really. The black hole is surrounded by a cloud of super hot gas that's falling in. The space around the black hole is so warped, it distorts the light that scatters across it. As bizarre as it seems, the gravity of a supermassive black hole is so spread out that you might fall in and survive for a moment.
during the final descent, you would then go into the event horizon, but you would actually not feel it um, because you are a small body compared to the large massive black hole. Now, thanks to a computer simulation based on Einstein's own equations, we can visualize the scene. As you move toward the black hole's core, you hit an inner horizon, a logjam of trapped light and energy. At a certain moment, as we hit the inner horizon, there's this infinitely bright, blinding flash of light. That's all the stuff that's been waiting there, trying to get out, is just held there at the inner horizon. It would vaporize you. Almost certainly, if you fell into a real black hole, you would simply, unfortunately, die. But that's not the end of the journey. The computer storm can be turned off, and the strange predictions of Einstein's equations allowed to play out. A passageway opens up, a tunnel through space and time known as a wormhole. We now leave through a strange door known as a white hole. Here, the twisted logic of extreme gravity goes into reverse. Instead of being sucked in, you would be catapulted out to the far reaches of time and space. But to where? In science fiction, wormholes offer handy escape routes to other universes. In reality, the inside of a black hole is probably too chaotic and violent for a wormhole ever to form. The black hole at the center of the Milky Way is strange enough as it is. But is it the norm? Or is our galaxy a freak of nature? To find out, astronomers have mounted a major international project to search galaxies throughout the universe for evidence of supermassive black holes. From Apache Point in New Mexico, astronomers are probing big galaxies out to a billion light years from Earth. They take a series of steel plates and drill holes to exactly match the location of galaxies in the night sky. Then they plug fiber optic sensors into those holes. And for the first time ever, they can use the plates to capture the light of hundreds of galaxies per night. The astronomers are looking for a distinctive light signature coming from a galaxy's core. It's a sign of hot gas swirling into a black hole. The goal of the project, called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, is to map a quarter of the entire northern sky to find out what kind of galaxies make up our universe and how they are arranged. Of the 125 billion galaxies that make up the visible universe, more than a million have so far been analyzed. Nearly all the large ones, circled in red, bear the signature of a supermassive black hole. The closer we look to the centers of galaxies, the more we find these black holes, and the inventory is rising high. So any idea for the formation of a galaxy will now have to include some explanation for how you get a black hole in its center. But how did every big galaxy in the universe end up with a giant black hole in the middle? To understand, go back to the very beginning. The Big Bang. Matter and energy rush outward as the universe expands. So you got the Big Bang handing you your birth ingredients, your hydrogen, your helium, your your traces of some other elements. So it's kind of like this, this soup. You put it together and stir it. It's gravity that stirs the soup. Over billions of years, it molds the universe into a spider's web of gas and galaxies. Within this web, gravity draws together wisps of hot, primordial gas. Over tens of millions of years, the clouds of hydrogen gas coalesce, growing more and more dense. 
sun grow hot enough to ignite. The first stars are born, giants, hundreds of times bigger than our sun. They burn out quickly and explode in the flash of a supernova. Billions of years later, an orbiting satellite called SWIFT is in position to capture that flash of light. SWIFT is the eyes of an international group of astronomers. Within 30 seconds of detecting a flash, it sends out an alert via mobile phones, pages, and emails. Adam Mike Ford calling. We have a GRB detection. Please meet me at the observatory and call the GRB team. The astronomers scramble to their telescopes. Speed is vital. They have to catch the light beam if they are to probe the dark secrets behind these distant disasters. First, they determine how far it has traveled, give it a name, and pinpoint its birth galaxy. Then we're gonna need to move the dome, Casey. By analyzing the light, they have gleaned the distinctive signatures of black holes being born. The most distant are the earliest generation of primordial monsters. We could be forming the seed of the supermassive black holes that we see in galaxies today very early on when the very first uh, objects form in the universe. We can now, with our big telescopes, look back in time. And, and sure enough, what we find is that at the same time when the galaxies form, also the black holes form. It may very well be that they needed each other. This computer simulation shows how our Milky Way galaxy was born. It grew over billions of years from a swarm of smaller galaxies smashing together, merging. In a cosmic dance of death, the infant galaxies swirl around and orbit one another, gravity pulling them closer. If another galaxy comes too close, they will each feel each other's gravity. What started out as a stately ballet of stellar orbits moving around the center of their galaxy has now become this, this maelstrom. There's no other way to say it. Galactic cannibalism, that's what they're doing. They're dining on their neighbors, eating entire galaxies. Well, for every galaxy you eat, if that galaxy has a black hole in its center, it's gonna eat the black hole. And the black hole will work its way down to the center of the large galaxy, making the center of the galaxy bigger as well as the galaxy itself. As galaxies swallow each other, the black holes at their centers merge and grow. And there was an epoch once, about one, two, three billion years after the Big Bang, when in fact galaxies were forming, or at least they were tremendously more active than now. And at the same time, black holes already existed, had formed, and were fed at, at, tr at tremendous rates, producing very powerful quasars. Quasars are bright beacons of light at the centers of distant galaxies, where feeding black holes shine brighter than anything else in the universe. The Hubble Space Telescope peered into a dormant quasar in a nearby galaxy called M87. It found a tiny central region where gas is heated to tens of millions of degrees and whipped by gravity to millions of kilometers per hour. What it became obvious was that there was a tremendous amount of mass in a very small volume. But that mass was very unlikely to be stars like those stars that we see in our galaxy. Astronomer Brian McNamara believes giant ravenous black holes can have a profound effect on the surrounding galaxy and beyond. Now, can we get an offset? 180? 180, 180, 180, same direction. We are setting at uh, 360, 360. Guider is locked up. McNamara yeah, is studying okay. a trail of devastation left in their wake. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. 
all of these other galaxies are gravitationally bound to all of these other galaxies are gravitationally bound to this galaxy cluster. So they're all uh, buzzing around this giant galaxy like bees buzzing around a hive. These clusters are the product of galactic cannibalism on a cosmic scale. This computer simulation shows how a galaxy cluster evolves in a dense region of the universe tens of millions of light years across. Hundreds of galaxies form, then swarm toward a common center. A central galaxy swallows them up. As it grows, so does the black hole. McNamara is searching for the monster's paw print. So that's a giant galaxy sitting in the middle of a, a cluster of galaxies. So the idea is that that's a big galaxy and right down at the center you can't see it. We think there's probably a black hole that's got a mass that approaches a billion suns. It very recently in the last um, uh, several uh, tens of millions of years gobbled up a lot of matter and it uh, caused a huge eruption. McNamara zeroes in on a distant galaxy cluster two and a half billion light years away. Called MS-07, it's hidden in a vast cloud of hot gas. There's an atmosphere of gas um, that pervades the entire galaxy cluster. And it's an atmosphere like our atmosphere, except that it's far less dense and it's, and it's um, much, much hotter. McNamara noticed that two immense cavities in this cloud had been hollowed out. That cavity here and this cavity here we could stuff 600 Milky Ways in there. It's just astonishing. The energy involved is huge. McNamara believes this eruption of energy is the most powerful since the Big Bang itself. He traces its source to the core of the giant central galaxy, a supermassive black hole. But how does a black hole, a creature famous for devouring everything within its grasp, spew energy across the universe? As matter falls in, um, what we know now is that it spirals around in a disk, okay, very much the way when water goes down the drain. And the speeds that matter can, can achieve around that black hole approach the speed of light. And when matter travels at that speed, it gets a tremendous amount of energy. The matter falling into a black hole is a lot of stuff trying to get into a very small place. And so it's like trying to fill a dog dish with a fire hose. Most isn't going to get in. A high-speed whirlpool of matter coils around the black hole, creating a powerful magnetic field that hurls enormous volumes of gas outward. It produces a powerful jet of matter hundreds of millions of times the power of the sun that blasts right out of the galaxy. There's no question that the black holes at the centers of galaxies have a profound influence on their surrounding. They send out these huge jets moving at almost the speed of light. And those jets can send shock waves into the surrounding medium, change their surroundings completely. They have a dramatic influence. These jets can literally sterilize the galaxy by halting the formation of new stars. In principle, galaxies can grow um, to very, very large sizes, and what we see in the universe is that they don't. And we think that the supermassive black holes at the center may be the culprit. They may be responsible um, for preventing runaway growth of galaxies. In smaller galaxies, all this violence can have a creative impact black hole blast waves spread heavy elements generated in the core of the galaxy, setting the stage for the formation of new solar systems. We usually think of black holes as God's dumpster, but they really are actors on the galactic stage. The monster of the Milky Way may have helped create our solar system, but what's to stop it from wiping us out? It all depends on the monster's diet. One of the key differences between um, galaxies with supermassive black holes is whether or not their black holes are lit up because they're basically binging on a lot of material, material in its surroundings. 
For years, our own black hole has probably been fasting. But in 1999, the Chandra Space Telescope detected a powerful signal from the galactic center. Uh, station 3-4, Chandra OC. And just to let you know, we have about 18 minutes remaining in the playback. An explosion uh, just outside the event count. horizon. For the galactic center teams, the blast is a wake-up call. It was a hot piece of news at the time. Uh, a remarkable fact for all of us was, for many years, how inactive the black hole was. Bit of a puzzle that there are so many of the blue stars on that side, not on that side. Now, both Reinhard Gensel and Andrea Getz race to their telescopes. They will try to see whether the black hole's about to binge. The two teams join in a worldwide effort. Five major observatories will probe the black hole. From space, the Chandra X-ray Observatory will watch for high-energy light. Reinhard Gensel heads to Europe's very large telescope, set in the high desert of Chile. Andrea Getz climbs Hawaii's Mauna Kea volcano to the legendary Keck Observatory. When you're there, uh, it's an incredible rush. I mean, you're very much on for the few nights that you're there, hoping that your experiment works, hoping that the weather cooperates. Telescope time is precious. There's no room for mistakes. Madeline, we're ready to go. Right. The teams have five short nights to find out how much the black hole is eating by measuring the energy that flares out. Night one, the Chandra headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Zoom in a little bit more. All right, so first night. Doesn't look like we've got any flares. The telescope turns up only noise. X-ray flashes from small black holes roaming through the galactic center. Four more chances, guys. Night two. The telescope in Chile has problems. Can I see the, the monitor, the, the correction? There's still not very much there. Well, we do need to sacrifice now someone here to... <laughs> to the gods or something like this. Should I volunteer? Even if there are flares, the very large telescope can't see them. We have to redo the acquisition, or we redid the acquisition. What's happening? It was, the correction was... Let's step off. Yeah, unstable. A patch of humidity is warping the delicate optics. Everything's a blur. We have to change something because we can look at the guy's stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now we have a problem with the eight meter, with the main mirror. The eight meter mirror seems to be deformed. In Hawaii, it's not much better. The galactic center is playing hide and seek behind overcast skies. We're fighting with clouds. It looked better just a moment ago, so it looked like it looked like we were, we were just to ready to go. But now it's looking like finally. On night three, right. it's really flaring. The German team's luck changes. In Chile, okay, they spot long. an outburst. It has been going on for more than an hour already. That's, actually, that's, that's the best flare event that, that we saw during this run. So we have these a new point of light time. appears in the star field, one that wasn't there before. Okay. So here we clearly see that there's basically no source at that position okay. between those two blobs. On the other side, we have the same region and we clearly see that they're the same two sources, and now in between we see an additional source. So this is a flaring state. When the Chandra team receive their data from space, they can see it too. Oh, all right. All right, here we go. Ah. Oh, yeah. There we go. That's huge. All right. That's at least 0. .0. All right, so that's at least a factor of like 15 or so. Uh, so let's pick the X-rays show a spike that coincides with the flash of light captured by the Germans. News from our colleagues, of course, telling us that they are a few, few hours further west, so the sun hasn't even set yet. The stars of the galactic center haven't yet risen above the Hawaiian horizon. Getz has missed the flare. This part kills me. Waiting. Mm. But the next night, the team gets what it's looking for. Oh, I like that image a whole lot better. This is it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really. We were taking measurements, um, and you didn't see anything from the, the black hole. All you saw was a star, and then 
bam, it was there and bright. And 15 minutes later, it was gone. So that was our moment to make the measurement. And it was extremely exciting to know that we'd actually been able to. One day, not long from now, these scientists hope to see the monster directly yeah, by hoping. linking observatories around the world in a giant telescope powerful enough to peer deep into the center of the galaxy. What they will see is a dark specter framed by flashes of light. These are just flares compared with the monumental eruptions of its past. Our black hole had a, uh, a wild teenage life. I'm pretty sure of that. It probably had jets. It threw lots of matter out. It uh, had a grand old time. And now it's decayed into the old folks' home uh, of the galaxy. But what would it take for the monster of the Milky Way to awaken? Could explosive jets of energy once again blast across our galaxy? The watch is on at the very ends of the Earth. Astronomers have come to the South Pole to monitor radio signals from the galactic center. They can see signs of a disaster in the making. A vast ring of gas is looming just beyond the Milky Way's central black hole. In time, it will accumulate 300 million suns worth. When the ring reaches a tipping point, it will begin to funnel into a second ring that orbits close to the center. The inner ring will condense into a giant cloud. Within it, a storm of new stars will be born. Then the gas cloud will begin to spiral down into the grasp of the black hole. When the feasting starts, the eruption will be visible far beyond our galaxy. Our galaxy will survive its black hole's upcoming feast, but it isn't likely to survive a threat further down the road. Galactic cannibalism. Our galaxy the Milky Way is not immune from these colliding galaxy scenarios. We've got neighbors. We're falling towards each other. And one day we will collide. Even now, the end of our galaxy is approaching. Our giant neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, is charging toward us. Knowing the galaxy's dimensions, flight paths, and the laws of gravity, Scientists can predict how the clash of titans will unfold. What our simulations show is what could happen basically in a, quite a few billion years from now when the two galaxies will actually approach each other and merge. First, the galaxies will circle and entwine, ripping each other apart. Imagine what that might look like from another galaxy. You'll see two grand, beautiful spiral galaxies moving towards each other, slowly losing their shape. They'll see new avenues where stars and gas can funnel down towards this newly formed center, feeding this reborn monster. The collision will send a blizzard of stars and gas billions of kilometers into space. Some will shoot toward the crowded core of the new galaxy, spurring even more massive explosions. Amid the turmoil, our little solar system will be flung into the voids of space or driven into the black hole's jaws. In the, the process of merging, there will be a, a very uh, a strong starburst event occurring at the time of the merger as all of the gas is being funneled and uh, uh, towards the center, as well as the two black holes that are likely to merge will also swallow a lot of this gas. So the black hole in our own Milky Way will ignite, emitting so much energy that all of the gas around it will again be blown away in this very substantial wind, in very substantial outflow. The Milky Way will be destroyed, but what about the black hole at the center? 
it will merge with Andromeda's. Once considered freaks of the cosmos, black holes may simply be the workings of a restless universe. As we forge ahead in trying to understand how we came into being and how all of the matter got put down in the universe, uh, we can't leave black holes out of the picture because it seems they play a fundamental role on very, very large scales. Black holes not only actively shape the landscape in which they're embedded, they wreak havoc upon it. Throw in a hungry beast in the middle of it all and it distorts the gas clouds. It flings stars hither and yon. It creates energy fields that would fry any life in its vicinity. That kind of makes the center of galaxies interesting places. Black holes are the kind of the spice of the universe. They're a major player in the evolution of the things that light up our night sky. Even though we can't see them, they are, in a sense, the secret shadows behind the waltz of the galaxies. Scientists today are bringing us closer to a shadowy presence that long ago erupted across our galaxy and shaped the universe we know. For the moment, the monster is resting quietly. But how long will we have to wait for it to rise again? if that footage was placed in front of them. And that's what I did. The rest fell into place in a matter of hours. A video editor copied a section of wheat from another part of the field, pasted it over the formation, and it looked like the field pre-formation. Throw in a few balls of light, dissolve the superimposed wheat from the inside out, and voila. You have your circle. It's amazing. Wavy then took the tape to a pub frequented by crop circle enthusiasts where it stirred up a frenzy that continues to this day. At first viewing, without having investigated the events of the 11th of August 1996, the National Geographic television show seems like a credible debunking of the Oliver's Castle video. However, when I investigated the situation, not everything was as clear-cut and obvious as the National Geographic TV producers suggest. Firstly, people who were at the Barge Inn public house on the 11th of August 1996 say that the man in the National Geographic documentary is not the same person they saw. Secondly, there was no soundtrack on the original video footage. And more importantly, the man who came to the Barge Inn pub that day called himself John Whaley, not John Wabey. The person responsible for filming the Oliver's Castle footage has disappeared and has been replaced by a stooge. And this is not the first time that somebody who has filmed amazing video footage of crop circles and UFOs has disappeared. Two brothers from Germany at Manton and Wiltshire, several years before, filmed amazing footage and they too have disappeared, never to return back to England. There, there's the thing. A light. Yes.
Let us not forget that National Geographic Television have made at least two documentaries where the TV production team have collaborated with crop circle hoaxers. Two Dutch authors who I interviewed for this film, that's Bert Janssen and Janet Ossebard, allege that there is some kind of conspiracy, a crop circle conspiracy. Bert Janssen and Janet Ossebard have investigated UFOs and crop circles for more than 12 years. They allege that there is a scam to debunk the existence of crop circles and to debunk the Oliver's Castle footage. The Oliver's Castle footage is the first time that multiple balls of light have been filmed on camera. Interestingly, three years later, in 1999, British ufologist Donald Fletcher and American crop circle researcher Patricia Murray both filmed multiple balls of light flying over a crop formation at Barbary Castle in Wiltshire. The similarity of the 1996 Oliver's Castle footage and the film shot by Donald Fletcher and Patricia Murray show the exact same phenomena. The balls of light are the same size and luminosity. The speed at which they fly is also very similar. However, National Geographic Television failed to mention the 1999 Barbary Castle footage filmed by Donald Fletcher and Patricia Murray, even though it shows the exact same phenomena as the 1996 Oliver's Castle video. Why is that? Well, Donald Fletcher is a friend of mine, he's English, and Patricia Murray is another friend of mine, and she's American. Donald filmed this with a British video camera, and Patricia used an American video camera which uses a completely different video system. They visited the Barbary Castle crop circle at different times on the same day. That's two people from two different countries using two different video cameras that use two different recording methods. One is British PAL and the other one is American NTSC. Both these videos from the same day at Barbary Castle filmed in 1999 by Donald Fletcher and Patricia Murray show the same luminosities, the same balls of light flying across a field. No wonder National Geographic and other mainstream media outlets have failed to debunk that particular video. I believe that the Oliver's Castle video is genuine. Now, why is that? I believe it's genuine because it shows UFOs right at the very top of the video frame, which cannot be seen on a standard television. A standard television cuts about four millimeters around the edge of the screen off of the actual picture that you can see on a standard TV. Now I presented this evidence in a three-hour documentary in 1999 on the Enigma channel. Now several people, including Peter Sorensen, who claimed to be serious crop circle investigators and claimed to have actually analyzed the Oliver's Castle footage before me, failed to detect the UFOs at the top of the picture. Now in this area, which a normal television doesn't show, which is about four millimeters around the edge of the picture, I discovered a large UFO on the upper edge of the video frame. And this comes down to an ash tree on the hedgerow in the field at the rear of the picture. It is from this large mysterious object that two of the spherical balls of light are ejected. They leave the larger object that goes behind the small ash tree and fly over the crop circle in the foreground of the video footage. Now, if 
These UFOs, these balls of light in the Oliver's Castle video were completely and utterly animated, as National Geographic television claim and many other crop circle hoaxes claim, then why would somebody spend hours and hours and hours animating UFOs, balls of light, which could not easily be seen on a normal television? Remember that the video was shown in the Barge Inn pub the same day that the formation had appeared. At the most, if the video and crop circle were hoaxed, then the man in the National Geographic documentary, who claims to be the originator of this footage, would have only had about nine hours to film the empty field at dawn, then make the crop circle, then climb back up the hill, film the formation, drive from Wiltshire to Bristol, transfer the footage into a video animation system, animate the balls of light, render the new fake footage onto a tape which could be played on a camcorder, which is not so easy in 1996, get back into his car and drive to the Barge Inn pub in Wiltshire. If the producers of the National Geographic Channel think the Oliver's Castle video is fake, then what about Donald Fletcher's footage and Patricia Murray's footage filmed in 1999? as it shows exactly the same phenomenon. The trajectory and luminosity and speed of the balls of light is the same. And what about all the dozens of other video clips of balls of light filmed by crop circle researchers? Are they also fake? is a remarkable story about the inhabitants of a small and rocky ocean-covered little world in orbit around an ordinary star in an ordinary galaxy. And this story goes that these beings with soaring imagination and laughing at the idea of boundaries and limitations over time developed the languages of mathematics and science became skilled technologists, developed mastery over gravity, and eventually flung themselves and their machines into the interplanetary space surrounding them. And they did this merely in response to an innate desire to explore and to learn about their cosmic neighborhood and to secure the future of their progeny and to seek the answers to questions that had vexed them and every generation of their ancestors before them, how is it that their small planet and they living on it came to be? And what is the great cosmic theater in which life on their planet had unfolded? Well, you probably figured it out already, but this is a story about us. And we humans have been interplanetary travelers now for over 50 years. We've been to just about every corner of the solar system. We've been to all the planets, all eight of them. We even right now have a spacecraft on its way to Pluto, and of course, we have set foot on our own moon 40 years ago this year. And these magnificent journeys, these long, arduous journeys, have in fact rewarded us with insights into the origin of the Earth and its fellow planets, and they have shown us with startling clarity our place in the cosmos. The most memorable of Cassini's returns is an image that will probably be Cassini's greatest legacy. Across a billion miles of interplanetary space, we can spot our own planet Earth nestled in the arms of Saturn's rings. There is a powerful recognition that stirs within us when we see our own gorgeous little blue ocean planet as it would be seen by others in the skies of other worlds. It's a recognition that never fails to move us. And it is here, in this picture, where Darwin meets Galileo. Because it is a picture that's made possible 
by Galileo's first experiments with gravitation so long ago, and it is a picture that to me shouts evolution. I look at this image and I see our ancestors stepping down from the trees and walking upright for the first time onto the African savannas and pausing to look back at the forest from which they came. And I look at this image and I see a species that is positively unyielding in its pursuit of knowledge and brave and fervent in its longing to grasp the meaning and the significance of its own existence. And finally, I see in this image the very best that humanity has to offer. We are perhaps the small and troubled inhabitants of one tiny little planet, but we are also the dreamers and the thinkers and the explorers who took this picture. One world across a billion miles of space to another, the extraordinary citizens of planet Earth. Away out there in space, there's huge clouds of dust and gas. And if one of those clouds of dust and gas is massive enough, its own gravity causes it to start to collapse. So it falls in on itself. And towards the centre of that cloud, it gets denser and denser. It gets hotter and hotter. And eventually, the particles that the, that the gas and the dust are made of are brought so close together that they start to stick together. They start to fuse. That's the energy source of a star. The star switches on and begins to shine. Inside every newborn star, hydrogen atoms are fused together to make helium. This process is called fusion, and it creates the energy that powers every star. What happens to a star during the rest of its life depends on how massive it is at its birth. A star like the Sun is in a delicate balance between gravity, which wants to make the star collapse in on itself, and the pressure that pushes outwards that comes from the energy that's been produced in these fusion reactions happening at its core. However, at some point in the future, the hydrogen runs out. And at that point, the core of the star will start to collapse in on itself under its own weight. It gets denser, it gets hotter, until a point where you can actually start to use the helium atoms themselves as the fuel for the fusion pushing helium atoms together and making carbon and oxygen the next heavier elements in the periodic table. As the star begins to fuse helium, it creates more energy and that causes the outer layers of the star to expand. One day, our sun will grow so large it will swallow up the inner planets of the solar system out as far as the Earth. It will become a red giant. For the sun, this will be the beginning of the end. What happens is that the outer layers of the star get farther and farther from the middle. The force of gravity that they feel is getting weaker and weaker. And actually, the star loses hold of its outer atmosphere. Its outer atm atmosphere drifts off out into space. It expands out to become a planetary nebula. And they're some of the most beautiful objects in the universe. Once the outer layers have drifted away, all that is left of the star is its core. A white dwarf star is the dead remnant core of a star like the Sun at the end of its life. What's left behind is something that might weigh as much as half the mass of the Sun, but it's only about the size of the Earth. So it's an incredibly dense object, it's dead, there's no nuclear fusion going on it anymore, it's incredibly hot, but then over millions of years it will gradually cool down to become a black dwarf. Some stars, however, are much more massive than the Sun, and they lead very different lives. They are able to fuse heavier and heavier elements inside their core. The star gets bigger and bigger. Some grow up to a thousand times the size of our sun, until it has fused elements all the way up to iron. And once we've formed an iron core, there's no more energy can be got from fusion. That core collapses. The rest of the star starts to collapse in after it, but then it bounces off. There's a huge shock wave, and in just a second, Bang! The outer parts of the star are blasted off into space in a huge supernova explosion. These supernova explosions are so powerful that when one of these stars explodes, it can actually outshine the whole galaxy of which it's part, a galaxy of maybe 100,000 million stars. For these supergiant stars, all that is left is the super-dense core, 
known as a neutron star, an object that can have a mass greater than our Sun, but be less than 20 kilometers across. But for the most massive stars of all, we think when the core collapses, the gravity is so strong, it becomes a black hole from which not even light can escape. So stars are actually the, the places in the universe where the elements are created. After the Big Bang, our universe contained only hydrogen and helium. All the other heavier elements were therefore fused inside stars. The amazing thing is that virtually everything you see around you was made inside a star billions of years ago before the sun and the planets were formed. And when that star died and blasted its guts out into space, that formed the raw materials from which our sun, the planet Earth, and indeed ourselves were made. And actually, I think that ultimately that's one of the, the major reasons why I think understanding stars is crucial, because it's actually telling us where we came from.